Follow all the 2024 election insanity with the State of the Race podcast series is available wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check us out on YouTube, youtube.com slash America. Click the bell for notifications. Uh, we really do appreciate it when you do that. Dan Andros is going to be here for a little bit and break us down all the, all the stuff going on in the world. Um, one of the main things is this Fannie Willis story. We'll get into that as well. But we're going to start by doing the 2024 Iowa caucuses. Yes, we are here. It is uh, Iowa caucus day. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a little snowy here in Texas. I'm home. I'm in um, my wife's podcast studio here. You might be able to tell with a giant pink sign behind me. And we are talking about the Iowa caucuses from home. Why? Because outside, I'm looking out the window right now. It's a little snowy. It's a little icy. It's very cold, especially for Texas. And what happens in Texas when you have any little sign of cold weather, the entire state shuts down, basically. It gets really ugly really fast. No one knows how to drive on this stuff. This is not like the Northeast where I grew up, where people would just go out in this without even thinking about it. Uh, or, uh, you know, anywhere up north where you have to deal with this stuff all the time. We don't have any resources to really shut this down. So there's no there's no real salt trucks. There's no plows. There's no nothing. So when this happens, everything sort of stops. And, and when I say plows, I mean, plows wouldn't even do anything with this. It's like an eighth of an inch of snow outside. But it is an interesting thing to be here at home today. We got a message from Glenn last night that he was going to be doing the show from home. And I looked out the window and I'm like, eh, there's a few flurries. You know, there's not a lot going on out there, but luckily we're able to do our jobs from home. But it did make me think about what's going on in Iowa today, where the weather is, to me, catastrophic. To me, civilization limiting. To me, it's almost like after a weekend like this, you should just shut down the state and move. That's that's what it seems like to me. I don't understand. I don't understand wanting to live in cold weather. I don't understand dealing with it. Uh, the reason why I live in Texas is not because I wanted to follow Glenn Beck anywhere. It's because I wanted to get the heck out of the Northeast after living there my whole life. I hate it up there when it comes to weather. It drives me crazy. I don't like slushy feet. And I'm, I'm a wuss. It's an easier way to summarize it. I'm a complete wuss in every way. And I, I admit that. I embrace it. It's true. Do I wish it wasn't true? Maybe only slightly, just a little bit, but not much. So you think about this and you think about where, you know, I'm doing a show from home today with almost, you know, no real massive weather problem. And a lot of people are staying home. I mean, I haven't seen anybody out on the streets really passing by the house. It's It's been a pretty quiet day. And there's a difference between this and what's going on in Iowa tonight. Tonight, if you want to go caucus, it's difficult. And, you know, there's something charming to the process in Iowa there's something charming to the difficulty. People are like, well, this isn't very democratic. It doesn't shine of democracy. It doesn't seem like much of a democracy to make people uh, go out in the middle of the night and, and caucus and, and spend time at a location and have to show up in person. That doesn't sound very dem democratic. I don't know. To me, it kind of does. You know, I make this point all the time, but when I was a kid, I remember MTV doing Rock the Vote. And Rock the Vote was this big, I don't know if they still do it or not. I don't even know if it's still a channel or not, honestly. But it was a big deal back in the day. And they would say, oh, you got to rock the vote for, you know, Bill Clinton. Okay, they would never say that overtly, but just Bill Clinton would be on the air with them all the time. And it, it was fascinating to watch that happen because it has this sort of inherent implication that everybody who can vote should vote. And I kind of fundamentally disagree with that. I know people get mad when I say that, but like fundamentally, you shouldn't vote if you don't know what you're talking about. You know, we have the shirts we made up a while ago that say, um, learn, then vote. The order is important. And I stand by that. If you don't know anything about this election, don't feel bad staying warm and staying home. Now, I would encourage you in the future to spend the time to learn about it, to think about it, to process the information, learn about the candidates, see which one you think is going to be the best, and, and understand why you're supporting that person. Is it just because a bunch of people on your Facebook feed are promoting that person? Is it because you saw a couple of lawn signs? Or is it because you actually know their platform, you know their record, you know what they, they're going to do when they're in office? Those things are the really important things when you're deciding on who you're going to vote for. All this other crap is just a sideshow. And if you want to go down that road, 
I get it. I mean, I get why Democrats target low information voters, right? They're easy to persuade. If, if someone doesn't have a foundation, it's easier to knock over their home or at least move it to the trailer park down the street. You know, that's how that works. Democrats do that for a reason. They don't focus on you. They don't focus on the person who's listening to talk radio all day. They don't focus on the person who's reading governmental reports on spending. They don't target those people. They target the people who never think about this at all. Why do you think they love mail-in voting so much? Now, look, as a person who didn't even go to work today, there's a part of that that's appealing. You know, I've had to vote many times absentee over the years because, you know, we're doing election coverage and we're, you know, we're out of state. And those are usually reasons that you're allowed to vote absentee. And I've taken advantage of that because, honestly, it would be impossible for me to vote otherwise. But when you talk about, like, mailing people ballots who don't even ask for them, let alone giving an excuse. The old way used to be, oh, you have to come up with some excuse. Oh, you're going to be out of state. You're going to be uh, uh, in the military. You've got some real reason why you can't vote in person. And then it kind of turned into, well, just ask. Just just you know, write in, fill out the stupid form, send it in, we'll, we'll give you the ballot. That'll be nice and easy. How about that? And now we've advanced to the point of, don't even ask. We're just going to send ballots, you know, willy-nilly to every single home in our state and see what happens. Is there fraud? I mean, how could you possibly detect it, right? It goes into some, these are a lot of times going to people's houses who don't even live there anymore. Who knows what happens with those ballots? People who have multi, multiple people in the family, does one person fill them out? We don't know. We don't know. I'm sure it happens. I'm sure of it. It's not a great way to, to do this. That's why there's something charming about this caucus process, right? You know, the caucus, there is no early voting. None. There's no absentee voting. None. Show up that night. Stay for like an hour or two. That's your option if you want to be involved in this process. This is, of course, one of the things that drives people who really do care, right? These caucuses are filled up with people who really think about this stuff, who focus on it constantly, who go through multi-years a lot of times thinking about the differences between these candidates, meeting these candidates two and three times, dealing with volunteer after volunteer after volunteer, knocking on their door and saying, hi, we're with the blah, blah, blah campaign. Who are you going to be voting for coming up in 18 months from now in January? And all that comes down to a day like today where it's freaking so cold, nobody wants to leave their house. It's so cold, cars don't start. It's so cold, there are walls, four and five feet of snow packed up against the driveway so that people can't even get out of the driveway to go see campaign events. That's where we are in Iowa. And I do think that that puts us in a position where we have more uncertainty in this caucus than really ever before. I mean, when you look at previous caucuses, you could see a couple of themes that would come out. You'd see usually one leader, Maybe that leader's fading a little bit. Maybe there's an, uh, someone who's coming up from the bottom that's going to be able to take them out. And we've seen some real surprises in Iowa. I mean, uh, Mike Huckabee, uh, Rick Santorum, uh, Ted Cruz, John Kerry, even back in 2004, was a surprise in Iowa. And you can sometimes detect that in the polling, but not always. A lot of times what you'd see in the polling is a, a someone who was changing positions late, and that late change of positions oftentimes led to some momentum that was carried out inside the campaign. Are we seeing that in this particular set of caucuses? I mean, there's some evidence to that. I mean, you can point, you can squint and see all sorts of things in this polling. And Nikki Haley is, is probably the one you'd point to that is showing a little bit of late polling momentum. But I want to get into that a little bit more when we look at the fundamentals of what we're seeing underneath the polls. Before we get to the, the real minutia, the cross tabs, all the nerdy stuff, let me start you with sort of the top line. One of the things people will do when they go back and look at the picture of an election, how did it develop? How, what were the twists and turns? How did we you know, know what was going to happen? How did the polls perform? You'll go back and look at something really basic. And a, a really good basic tool is the Real Clear Politics polling average. And what they do is they just take the most recent polls they add them up, uh, they average them, and they give you a picture of the race. 
not going to go into a ton of detail on this, but averaging polls is usually better than looking at one poll. You know, a lot of people like to say, uh, and I've said it, uh, the, 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 a lot of people think of the Iowa Des Moines, Des Moines Register poll as the gold standard poll. That is what, uh, generally speaking, what uh, people will say about it. And and look, you know, the, they tend to do a decent job kind of staying by the old school polling techniques. They don't take a lot of liberties with online polling or things like that. And that's why they're kind of highly respected. Um, but looking at one poll is not necessarily as good as looking at five or six or seven at a time. And since the, in the, about, about the past week, we've had, uh, what, five polls that have come out that have given us, giving us a late picture as to what Iowa might look like. Let me just run these down for you, and then I'll give you the final averages. Um, there was an Iowa State poll that came out. This is from January 5th through the 10th. Had Trump at 55, Haley at 14, DeSantis at 14, Ramaswamy at 8, and Asa Hutchinson is still in the race with a big fat zero. Suffolk University had a poll. We kind of discussed this a little bit late last week. 54 for Trump, 22 for Haley, 13 for DeSantis. I mean, a nine. If DeSantis loses this tomorrow, or, you know, we find out tomorrow that he's lost this um, race by nine points, that's going to be catastrophic for him. No doubt there. Ramaswamy at six and zero for Hutchinson. NBC News, De- Des Moines Register, which is that poll that I had mentioned. Kind of everyone looks for that one at the end to kind of see... They're the most well-established pollster. They have the most resources when it comes to this stuff. Uh, Trump, 48. Haley, 20. DeSantis, 16. Ramaswamy, 8. And Hutchinson, 1. Uh, The Trafalgar Insider Advantage poll that came out this week as well. Trump, 52. Haley, 19. DeSantis, 19. Ramaswamy, 7. And Hutchinson, 1. And finally, the Emerson poll, 55 for Trump, 21 for Haley, 15 for DeSantis, Ramaswamy with a five, and Hutchinson with a two. Now, again, if you followed Iowa polling throughout this entire uh, time, you know that a couple of these polls in particular are really bad for Ron DeSantis. Uh, The Suffolk University one's really bad. He's down by nine to Haley. Uh, the Emerson poll, he's down by six. I mean, even the uh, Des Moines Register, NBC News poll, he's down by four. <sighs> Look, I like Ron DeSantis. Any poll, though, where he finishes in third, is, or any final result where he finishes in third is really catastrophic for him. I mean, he, he's invested a lot of resources. The state is relatively well designed for him. I mean, he's not known as a particularly religious conservative. And you, if you go back and think about the names that I mentioned before, Huckabee, Santorum, some degree Cruz, although Cruz is maybe a little bit of a hybrid. Um, those candidates were known for sort of a, a religion first uh, face uh, front facing sort of uh, approach to the campaign. And I don't know that you'd say that DeSantis does that exactly. It's not exactly that. Um, but he's kind of more of the policy conservative view that's a little bit more prioritized and that has maybe not caught on as, as much. We, I guess we'll see. There's nobody in this race really who does that though. I and mean, there's not really a quote unquote religious candidate in this race right now. You would have argued Mike Pence was that perhaps going back a little ways, but really there's no one in here. I mean, Trump doesn't really fit that bill, even though he does well with evangelical voters. Haley does not. DeSantis does not. Ramaswamy does not. Uh, Asa Hutchinson does, but again, he's been a giant zilch the entire campaign. So let me give you that real clear politics average. This is going to be viewed as the final average going into the Iowa caucuses. Donald Trump, 52.8. Nikki Haley, 19.2. Ron DeSantis at 15.4. Vivek Ramaswamy, 6.8. And Asa Hutchinson with one. So maybe we have to, we'll go into this a little bit later about what do these candidates need to do to quote unquote win. I started this off telling you that polling tells you generalities. It doesn't tell you specifics. It's at least good at telling you generalities and not so great at giving you specifics, particularly prospectively. Like you want to look retrospectively at some of this, you can dig out some data and you can make some loose assumptions, though you shouldn't overdo that when you look at different cross tabs, minor, uh, you know, uh, minority groups, uh, religious groups, ages, uh, Those things you can get, again, general themes from, but you can overdo the importance. We saw that happen after the 2012 election where Republicans dove into that polling and said, well, what we need to do is be more open to the border uh, being crossed a lot. Not really a good policy for them. So you can look at this and you could say, okay, what is the picture of the race? What do these candidates need to do? What do they need to do to show a win? And honestly, when you look at this, Donald Trump 
is almost definitely going to win this race. I wouldn't say that with 100% certainty, though these in a normal election, I might. I mean, looking at these polls, looking at the fundamentals behind the scene, thinking about what this election really is, an election of a guy who used to be president, who's essentially treated as an incumbent, somebody who is incredibly uh, powerful within the party, and also somebody who is so well known, really, his, he isn't, you know, the, the coverage basically carries itself. You don't have to fight for coverage when you're Donald Trump. Knowing all of that, you'd look at this and you'd say, okay, Donald Trump's going to win this uh, handily. The, the one thing that would make you doubt that a little bit would be the weather situation. Is it possible that Trump voters are sitting there and saying to themselves, look, at the end of the day, uh, he's going to win anyway. Why am I getting out of the house? Why am I bothering with this? You could understand people kind of taking that approach, thinking this is a foregone conclusion. When it comes to the Haley situation, it's a little bit different. I want to dive into those polling details uh, coming up here in a little bit, uh, because really it is interesting. But she is Haley's polling position has improved markedly over the past month or so. I know, of course, DeSantis wanted to show some momentum. If DeSantis was rising and getting into the low twenties routinely here, you might say, okay, his 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 organization is so good in Iowa, perhaps uh, he can make a run here. And I think a win for for uh, Ron DeSantis is some sort of moderately close second. I'm not saying he has to win the uh, 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 election. I don't think he does at this point. I think. There is some sort of um, uh, expectations are always built into these things. So Donald Trump right now at 53% and their real clear politics average, if he, see, if he finishes at 39, let's say, which is plausible, I, I don't think it's un, uh, impossible to believe he'd be down in that area of 39, 40%. It's going to seem a little disappointing, even though I, I don't know if that's fair, right? I mean, uh, you know, again, uh, Donald Trump, uh, if he wins, he wins, you know, Um uh, Ron DeSantis, who I think a year ago would have been disappointed, you know, 15, 18%. If he can show in the mid 20s to high, like if he loses, if it's 39, 29, 20 with those three candidates, that's probably a pretty good win for Ron DeSantis as far as his expectations go. And now we're kind of in that game where you're just trying to make it to the next state. You're trying to say, oh gosh, am I going to be able to, to, uh, to successfully continue this campaign now the polling momentum for haley is there but it's weak it is it's a bit hollow when you look at the numbers overall if you kind of dive in again the, this is from the um des moines register poll trump at 48 haley at 20 desantis at 16 when you look at the enthusiasm there's a really big difference here the enthusiasm for donald trump is high and it's higher than even for ron desantis and you might think to yourself well I mean, he's already been president. He's winning by so much. Why, do pe are, why are people still all that enthusiastic? Well, they are. But let's see, 49% uh, of people are either extremely enthusiastic or very enthusiastic when it comes to having Trump as their first choice. DeSantis is n next in line there, but considerably behind. I mean, he, he's at, uh, let's see, 53, 62%. 62% are either extremely or very enthusiastic. So again, 88% for Trump. 62% for DeSantis. Haley's at 39% on that number. That's really low for a candidate who's in second place. It does not strike you as a person who, um, who has a passionate voting uh, base. And what you kind of see here is interesting in that we, we've talked about this for a while. A lot of people said, well, what we need, if you're a Trump uh, opponent, what we need are these uh, uh, candidates to drop out of the race, and then we'll have a clear path and have a one-on-one. -on -one. And that always sounds good in theory, but it's always more messy than that. And what's happened here is a lot of people who um, maybe were supporters of Chris Christie or supporters of Tim Scott or supporters of Mike Pence that didn't like Donald Trump, as they've fallen out, most of those voters haven't necessarily gone to Trump but some of them have gone to Nikki Haley, and they're very soft Haley. They're soft Haley supporters. So they're not considerably passionate about Haley, but they think maybe she has the best chance to win. They see the New Hampshire polling, which is better for Haley. So it is a little bit of a dance here. And that dance goes on inside the walls of, the, of each individual caucus, right? 
Um, people will come out, they'll make their case, they'll try to convince each other, there'll be a little horse trading going on, back and forth, back and forth the whole time the night goes on. And the night goes on in a way that really can move voters. Um, we've seen this before. If a candidate is thinking, oh God, or uh, uh, someone who's going to the caucus kind of thinks, well, my candidate's not going to win, I, I don't like this, I don't like uh, Nikki Haley, maybe I'll go with Ron DeSantis. I think there's a a good chunk of people who will go to the DeSantis side today because his organization's really strong. That usually matters in Iowa. Will it matter today? I, I don't. I don't know. I was talking to Glenn a little bit earlier, and he's like, "Well, what's your prediction for this?" And honestly, like I look at this as a a big question mark. Um, you know, if you have ever done any sports betting, um, you have games where you're really you have a strong opinion on it, and you're thinking, "I, you know, I'll give you one example." I, I did not see a lot of hope for the uh, Kansas City or for the Miami Dolphins to go into Kansas City in minus 14 degree temperatures or whatever it was and pull that game off. It's tough. It's a warm weather team. You know, they're not a they're a finesse team. I really like watching the Dolphins play. I think they're really fun. But like that environment is really difficult on the road in Kansas City, frigid temperatures. I mean, it didn't even seem like anyone wanted to catch the ball, uh, it's, let alone get hit. It was a difficult game. I had a strong feeling on that game other games, I mean, I don't, you know, I mean, I, you get to that point where they, you know, it's kind of a stay away game. You look at it and you're saying, well, this feels more like gambling. Now you've, the, the longer you gamble, the more you realize it's all like gambling and you wind up usually losing money. But if you kind of back it up and say, well, you know, look, this feels like gambling. I see these two teams. I don't really have a strong feeling. I need to stay away. If I was looking at this as a better I would say, look, do I think Donald Trump's going to win Iowa? Yeah, I do. I think the polling has really been consistent with him way ahead. I don't, I don't see a huge sign of anyone catching him. On the second part of that, Haley leading DeSantis by four points in the average of polls, to me, seems like a stretch. I, I don't know that I buy it. Um, I will be surprised at some level if Haley blows DeSantis out. If DeSantis loses by nine, I think, you know, his campaign is probably over. And Haley's Haley is out there, but Haley, I think, has a totally different path to the nomination. And that path is incredibly narrow, as, we, as we've discussed several times. So what do you do with that information? You know, look, I think you should, if you're in Iowa and you're voting, you should do nothing with this. You shouldn't pay attention to the polls at all. You should go in there and vote for the person you think is best. Who would be the best president? Always make your decision that way. Ted Cruz had, had an antiquated sentiment that everyone got mad at back in the day, and it was called vote your conscience. And you know what? It's good advice then. It's good advice now. You want to vote your conscience? And your conscience is not made up your feelings or you know any of that. It's a total look at who you actually believe would be the best president. If you, It's one thing to prognosticate, and there's value to prognosticating. There's value to making predictions. But if you're making a prediction of who you think would win, then go to the prediction markets and make some money on it. Don't waste your vote on that. Don't waste your vote on who you think will win or who you think will lose. If you think Nikki Haley's the best candidate, but you're worried that she has light supports, you're going to go with Ron DeSantis, that's stupid. If you're Ron DeSantis voter and you think, oh gosh, well, Trump's going to win here. I might as well go with Donald Trump so I can be on the side of the winner. What's the point of that? If you're a Vivek, if you're a freaking Asa Hutchinson supporter, and you think Asa Hutchinson would be the best presidential uh, presidential candidate, you think he might have the best chance to beat Joe Biden, then for all, by all means, just go and vote for the guy. It's a, well, your vote's not wasted. Your vote is, this is a, a recording of what you, what is, what the, the, uh, the electorate feels. And the fact that, you know, pe people say this to me all the time. Well, what about my vote being thrown away? Show me all. You show me all the presidential elections that are designed that are, are one one vote difference, and then you can kind of make that argument. Even when you have five hundred thirty six votes in what was it, Florida back in the day, still you changing your vote wouldn't have necessarily made a difference there. You should vote for who you believe is the best candidate, and you let the chips fall where they may. We get in this weird like fantasy football world where we think we can control the outcomes and we get to make the trades and these votes will go this way if I do this and this will. Just do what you think is right. That's the easiest way to do it. And you can always live with yourself afterward. You might make the wrong decision sometimes, but you know at least you spent the time in the process to make sense of the world. And I think that's honestly like, there's not a lot asked of you as an American citizen, but that's a good amount to ask. Look at the information. Study it when you have time outside of your normal life where you've got to keep food on the on, on the table. And then 
go on and, 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 and vote and vote your conscience. That's not bad advice. That's not disloyal advice. These people are not loyal to you. Many of them will, every one of them will get into office and do things that are opposite of what they promised to you. You don't owe them anything. They are politicians. If anything, they owe you. They owe you. They work for you. And sometimes I think we forget that because of all the team stuff that goes on. Go out there, vote for who you believe would be the best person. We'll bring you the results tomorrow. We have the State of the Race podcast. We'll be covering a lot of that in the morning as well as uh, today here uh, on the show and uh, tomorrow on radio and, of course, on this podcast as well. We're going to take a break, come back uh, with Dan Andros, talk about uh, some of the election stuff and Fannie Willis, all the mess that she's in the middle of creating and her wonderful speech at church this weekend. We'll cover that here in just a second. This past December, drug shortages hit a record high, and this is causing severe disruptions in medical treatments. There's delays, treatment cancellations, and this is uh, this all do with rationing. And we're talking about stuff like you know amoxicillin that are a problem. When it, when it, what country do we live in? What is this? What, what do you mean we have a shortage of antibiotics? That should not be the case in the United States of America. Am I right on that? I, I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm expecting too much these days. You need the Jace case. The Jace case can help you prepare for this if you don't have access to these medications. If the supply chains break down, you can do something about that. You can actually uh, be prepared. People down the street might not have the things that they need. You don't have to worry about that with your family, at least. And you can actually help others if they're in time of need as well. You can personalize your Jace case uh, with five an uh, essential antibiotics and some other stuff as well. You can do everything from uh, you know, antibiotics to, to uh, ivermectin, if that's if that's your bag. Go to jacemedical.com, and you can enter the code STU at checkout for a discount on your order. The code is STU at jacemedical.com. you got to be prepared for everything. Um, you, can't, uh, you can't always know what's going to happen, and it's not just food and water. It's also things like medicine. jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E, medical.com. I want to bring in Dan Andros. He's, of course, from CBN News and CBN's Quick Start podcast, which you should subscribe to, of course, almost immediately following this particular segment. Dan, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me. Um, I want to talk about Fannie Willis. Now, Fannie Willis, remind people who she is. You, you kind of know of her as a um, uh, one of the people prosecuting Trump, but how can you possibly keep track of how many there are at this point? Who is Fannie Willis? Well, Fanny, first of all, I mean, I just I've never heard the name Fanny before. I just <clears throat> find that interesting. But uh, Fanny is the Fulton County District Attorney in Georgia, and she brought up Trump on racketeering, conspiracy and other charges by a grand jury in Fulton County. This is after they investigated him for two years, more than two years into potential election interference in that state. Um and then it gets interesting because she hires a lead prosecutor then to go ahead and prosecute this case. And we just find out in the last few days that this prosecutor now uh, apparently is having an affair with Fanny. He was he was into the Fanny and they <laughs> Fanny. apparently mm -hmm. this is and this is all allegedly, by the way. Right. Uh, this is this is a former Trump uh, campaign staffer who's uh, bringing these claims and bringing them up. And then not only is there the a potential affair, but the bigger problem, actually, aside from this potential moral failing, is the fact that this guy, Nathan Wade, apparently has a lack of relevant experience. And because you have to meet certain criteria, you know, when you're spending taxpayer dollars on things, right, like to prosecute a case, they have these standards that you're supposed to follow. And apparently they weren't followed here that she didn't she didn't get any approvals that she needed to get supposedly, and paid this guy $650,000 at least in legal fees to lead the prosecution on this case. And people are saying, well, wait a minute, uh, this <laughs> this kind of looks banana Republic-y-ish. And then apparently, again, you know, the, the Trump campaign guy that brought this up is saying that they, instead of, you know, they're using this money, this w excessive amount of money, not for this, but going on vacations and things like that. Uh, yeah. so 
And, yeah, and Janet, a lot correct going me if I'm wrong. The, the, the accusation in the political sense comes from the Trump uh, campaign. However, it, this sort of came up because of a divorce proceeding, like his divorce proceeding, right? This is an accusation leveled in that proceeding. And she hasn't, as far as I know, denied that this affair took place. It does not seem like she's saying, oh, absolutely not. I would never touch the guy. Seems like she's just getting quiet on this and has tried to go down this road of uh, oppression. And and this yeah. is, of course, the answer to every one of these things. Whenever you get in trouble, if you happen to be on the left side, you just claim racism and think you're going to get out of it. Um, she went to a, a church this weekend and, and made a speech in which she tried to basically outline this exact thing. We have, we have a clip of it, and it is uh, fascinating. We are at a time in history when you can no longer sit back and just let other folks do it. You cannot expect black women to be perfect and save the world. The Lord is completing us. We are not perfect. We need your prayers. We need to be allowed to stumble. We need grace. With that kind of support, we will move mountains and do Jesus' will. Okay, I can't take too much of this, but I, I mean, first of all, the context of this and uh, what she's trying to do here is disgusting. But like, did anyone expect b black women to be perfect? Did any? I mean, I think we all, everyone deserves grace, not just black women. People do make mistakes. No one's expecting her to be perfect. But I, was there anyone who's expecting that? No, I don't. I don't think there's one person who expects anybody to be perfect. And. <clears throat> I think that's uh, an interesting maneuver. It's it's a nice little tactical trick there to be like, well, you know, you you shift the goalposts and to to try to get it off of the failing. But you notice what she doesn't do there is she doesn't deny that it happened. Now, mm. and first of all, all of this happening on a church pulpit is just ridiculous, especially from the people who, if you mention anything even remotely coming close to a waft of political nature on the right side. It's Christian nationalism. They're trying to turn us into a Christian nationalist country. And then here you have a literal person who's bringing charges against the primary opponent to the president of the United States right now. And she's out in church tying that to God somehow. And uh, yeah, so... She doesn't deny it, which is a massive red flag there, right? She, I mean, she basically, if you got accused of cheating on your spouse, Stu, aren't you, if you're, and then you're invited to speak on the pulpit miraculously, somehow you, you get thrown up there. It's not the first thing you do, you know, if you're innocent saying, no, like this is all baloney. I uh, didn't do that. Wouldn't do that. Right? right. I mean, that the first thing you do. You think that'd be priority one. And OK, let's just say she, uh, you know, did this. And uh, there's a huge legal consequence when you're talking about the money and all of the other things related to that. But taking that out for a second, this idea that, you know, you, you, you're expected to be perfect as a black woman. Yeah. I, I mean, I, like I, no one's expecting perfection. I think maybe her, her husband was was, you know, expecting <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the honoring the basic tenets of marriage. I mean, that's probably something that was expected out of her, at least at some level. But I mean, perfection is not what we're looking for here. No, it's it just like, it seems like it's just a pathetic way to try to get herself out of trouble. Right. Like uh, we're not looking for perfection here. We're hey, how about not hire your your alleged <laughs> lover? <laughs> for way more than you're allowed to spend on him and then go on vacations with the money. We're we're saying that that, right? Like, right. you know, you could maybe lose your temper some days or I don't know, you know, you just uh, maybe you fired somebody too prematurely. I don't know. Like, there's a lot of things we're willing to forgive. Like, the bar is pretty low, I think, for politicians and prosecutors and all these people at, at this point. Like, we're not expecting a lot. Like, if... If you're not involved in like orgies in D.C., we're like, hey, this person's pretty decent. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, you burn the casserole. Uh, you have too much screen time. These are things right. we're all willing to forgive. <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> mass genocide of a, a, or murder is not something we would. There's a line, right? Like some things we're all going to say, hey, this is OK. We can deal with this with a public figure. Some things maybe not OK. And this is just a situation where not only... 
it's like this weird grasp toward every single argument ever made on the left all at the same time. It's like, oh, well, it was racism. Uh, it was sexism. It was, it was uh, politics. It, it's like all of these things just kind of mishmashing into one particular argument. I mean, I think the moral of the story here is just make sure if you're on the left, just make sure you fall into one of their special groups before you do anything unsavory, right? Like Anthony Weiner doesn't get any, like he can't go out there and go, ah, they're just, uh, they're just coming after me here because I'm white. A like, white male know, that's straight. A, a white male that's straight. <laughs> and, and yeah, he, he doesn't get that. He's like, ah, like, what do I do here? And like, but he couldn't come out there and say like, oh, well, they expect me to be perfect. And, uh, you know, so yeah, just make sure you're in one of those special groups and you should be all set. Hmm. All right. We have more coming up here in just a second. It's Iowa caucus day. Dan Andros joins us from CBN. We'll be back in just a moment. One of the great things we're starting to do now more of here at Blaze TV are these, these, these things called Blaze Originals. They're basically documentaries. And the second episode of this docuseries, Blaze Originals, is one where Glenn Beck is involved. He went to Liberty County, Texas, to give you the real story of Colony Ridge. Right-wing media, left-wing media have given kind of vastly conflicting reports on Colony Ridge. Blaze TV is going there to cover to give you the truth. Glenn was there. Jason Buttrell was there. Try to figure out what's actually going on there. And we can't do this stuff without your help. So we appreciate it if you're able to subscribe to do so. BlazeOriginals.com. If you use the code Colony Ridge, you'll get access to that documentary, all the other ones, all the shows, all the, the text articles. Really, you get a ton for this membership. And if you use the code Colony Ridge, you'll also save 30 bucks off your subscription. Colony Ridge, it's this giant area in Texas. It's a big threat to uh, the future of our country. And uh, we couldn't have made the documentary without you. So we do appreciate that. If you want to see the episode and future installments of Blaze Originals, help support the work we're doing by going to blazeoriginals.com today. Use the code Colony Ridge. Save yourself 30 bucks. The code is Colony Ridge at blazeoriginals.com. We're back with more from Dan Andros here in just a second. We're back with Dan Andrews from CBN's Quick Start podcast. Uh, Dan, you know, this United Airlines situation where the CEO was doing an interview, I think it was with Axios, and they're talking about diversity of pilots. And look, if every pilot I ever fly with in my entire life is a person of color and they get me from point A to point B, I'm fine with that. In fact, if white people are really crappy uh, pilots like they are, linebackers or you know i don't know safeties i'm fine with with never having another white pilot in my entire life i don't care i want merit when it comes to getting my 600 mile an hour trip to the ground safely uh, but it's amazing to see that these companies are coming out and admitting that they're not ba they're not hiring based solely on merit they're hiring based on all these other uh, characteristics and that's got to make you uncomfortable if you happen to be a traveler yeah, I mean, and I guess with uh, Pete Buttigieg here being, you know, the whatever role he's got now with the FAA or I, I forget his official title. I'm, I'm drawing a blank there, but secretary of transportation. Yeah, mm -hmm. transportation. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess is this the influence he's having? I mean, we've got doors flying off of planes. I can't remember <laughs> the last time I've heard about that in America. I mean, maybe that happens in like, you know, on Botswana Airlines or something. But I don't recall that sort of thing like happening here in America. And then the, the amazing thing about that Axios clip where he's grilling the CEO of United, he's just like like digging in on, well, what percentage are uh, minorities and women in your company? He's like, well, we are. Uh, I'd, I'd love to have you know that we are uh, upping our efforts and doing this and this and this to make sure that we have this and that and that. And he's like, but is it good enough? And he's just like grilling in. And I'm like, what bubble does this dude mm. live in in his life that this is the issue of his day? Doors are flying off airlines, and he wants to make sure that your airline is super gay and super diverse. Like, <laughs> I just want to land the plane. I want, it, I want it to go up in the air and then land safely. I don't care how gay it is. I don't care what gender is flying the plane. I don't care if the person thinks they're an elephant. If they can fly the plane and land it, good. 
do you <laughs> don't hire on anything else. There, there's no other qualification. I, I just I don't understand this world, Stu, where people imagine that what's happening at like a United is these pilots are coming in. You have black pilots, you know, white pilots, other different gender pilot, whatever. And they're like, you know what? We really like you. You're qualified and stuff, but I'm sorry. You're just too black. You're right. too black for us. What year is We're this? Take, we right. have to take the white guy. What year is this? Who's doing that? No one does that. So no. it's, In fact, it's mind boggling. If anything, it's the opposite. We all know yeah. that that's true. I mean, look, there's, uh, you know, this happens in every aspect of society where, you know, look at candidates. I mean, candidates constantly are praised for their skin color being non-white. Uh, you know, people get invited to Christmas parties, we're learning now, that, for not even being white. Um, th this is amazing. Like, real, this is, real quick, you, Stu, yeah, Stu, before go you go into that question, real quick. The mm -hmm. thing I'd like to note about this Axios interview with this guy, they're both white sitting here complaining about this problem. Like, wh where's they the representation on Axios, dude? Like, yeah. how come the, the black reporter from Axios, if they if you even have one, right. is uh, not allowed to do this interview? But I digress. Yeah, where's the diversity? Where's the diversity? Where, why is the CEO white? You know, they never guy. find their yeah. own job <laughs> no. to replace. It's always somebody no. else's. Somebody else. Uh, <laughs> by the way, and if you think this is just like one interview, I, I can understand that. A lot of times these things get taken out of context online. But two years ago, Chicago-based United Airlines decided to make piloting careers more accessible by opening their own flight training academy, United at Aviate, with the goal to train 5,000 new pilots by 2030, and an additional goal that half those pilots be women or people of color. And it's like, well... Forcing it. How about just merit? Who cares? Yeah. You don't even see the pilot most of the time. Who cares what color they are? Right, right. I mean, like, if you get on the plane, if the if the... Pilot gets on and says, you know what? Welcome uh, to United Flight whatever today. Uh, I'm just happy to be here. I don't really know what all these buttons are here, but I saw an <laughs> ad in the paper where they were like, hey, people who look like me might want to fly some planes. So here we are. Buckle up. We're going to see what happens. Mm. Who wants that? Who wants no. that? Because, you know, I know that's not what the stat the announcement would be, but it's essentially that. Like, you're just getting these people that maybe wouldn't even have cared about it and you're hoping that you just based on the cut like i want people who are interested in flying like there are those people yeah. right you, everyone knows people who pilot. live for it mm -hmm. they live for it they love all the pilot stuff let the people find that on their own i yes. don't need to urge people into flying other people around in giant tubes that go 600 700 miles an hour at 40,000 <laughs> feet in the air. i don't need it i don't find need your it. passion i don't need to know yeah. your skin color find your passion nope. fly the plane yep. well get me on the ground so i can get the hell away from the airport <laughs> yes. dan andros from cbn's quick start podcast appreciate you joining me today dan thanks a lot all right Depending on when you hear this or watch it, uh, there's so much going on tonight. Maybe the caucuses are over. Maybe I mean, we already know the results of them. Maybe people are voting right now. Who knows? Uh, that's going on tonight. The Iowa caucuses will have coverage on this on the State of the Race podcast, radio tomorrow, and TV tomorrow. There's going to be a lot to cover on what happens here. Do people f drop out? Uh, also, of course, tonight, maybe the Eagles have already lost. Uh, so please uh, say a quick prayer for myself and my sanity. Um, as a, the, you know, seasons, you don't, you don't want your, you know, your entire season to, to just disintegrate, um, in a few weeks, like it has for the Philadelphia Eagles. I mean, Hey, I can at least go back to this. They lasted at least one day longer than the Cowboys, which is not a lot, but we'll take it. Uh, we appreciate it. We'll see you tomorrow. Blaze TV.com slash stew promo code is stew.